5. Godly language versus the modern lingo. The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Psalm 12 verse 6. It is easy to prove that the modern versions consistently communicate in an impure fashion. Rather than immediately looking at many of the ways they do so, one example should reveal the magnitude of the problem associated with man tampering with the words of God. The book of Zechariah gives a very clear prophecy of the crucifixion. It reveals that the Lord would be wounded in the house of his friends, the Jews. The wounds in his hands clearly signifies that crucifixion was the manner of his death. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. John 20 verse 27 The Bible does not record that Thomas took the Lord up on his offer, but the wounds in his hands and side were clearly visible. Satan has been attacking the crucifixion for thousands of years. Consider this prophecy and realize its fulfillment by the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. KJB. Zechariah 13 verse 6 And one shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thine hands? Then he shall answer, Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Every modern translation must have sufficient changes to warrant a copyright. By law, new Bible versions only can be copyrighted if they are derivative works. Words must be changed to legally qualify for copyright protection and merit financial control. God commands man not to change his words and he spiritually blinds those who ignore his directive. Here is a case in point. Did the prophecy say hands or body? Neve. Zechariah 13 verse 6 If someone asks him, what are these wounds on your body? He will answer, the wounds I was given at the house of my friends. Or back. RSV. Zechariah 13 verse 6 And if one asks him, What are these wounds on your back? He will say, The wounds I received in the house of my friends. Or between your arms. NKJV Zechariah 13 verse 6 And one will say to him, What are these wounds between your arms? Then he will answer, Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Or your chest and your back. LB Zechariah 13 verse 6 And if someone asks, then what are these scars on your chest and your back? He will say, I got into a brawl at the home of a friend. A brawl? This is outright blasphemy. The reason that Bible believers get such a bad rap is because they have seen this foolishness for far too long it angers those who know the truth, Ephesians 4 verse 26. Two more points to consider concerning the blasphemous living Bible, above the Lord Jesus Christ had no scars and he did not get into a brawl. He willingly laid down his life. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. Isaiah 53 verse 7 This foolishness is a prime example of how bad things can get when man ignores God's explicit directives. God says, Don't change my word, don't add to it. Don't subtract from it. With over 100 different modern versions, do you think that changes are being made contrary to God's commands? If the words of the Lord are pure, as they are in the KJB, and if the word of God commands us to put off filthy communication, as the KJB does, why then is the language of the modern versions so impure? A sampling follows demonstrating the improper language used in the modern versions. The Living Bible The Unholy Word Kenneth Taylor claimed to have written the Living Bible so that children could understand the Bible. He addresses the page following the contents page of his 1972 Children's Living Bible to his dear young friends. He tells them he has written the Living Bible, LB, in easy words, so you can understand all of it if you read it carefully. Mr. Taylor went on to instruct his young readers, these books of the Bible are God's letters to you, pray and ask him to speak to you as you read. One as the following passages are discussed, consider how any sane adult could justify providing children with more explicit language and, in some instances, blatant gutter language in order to help them better understand the Bible. God blinded Kenneth Taylor because of his deliberate disobedience to God's explicit commands not to change his word. Adam knew Eve. The King James Bible uses very tactful language to discuss the marital relationship of two of the most well-known Bible characters, Adam and Eve. Adults reading these passages from the KJB can readily understand the delicate subjects addressed, without a child so much as raising an eyebrow as to the content. No modest man or woman would be embarrassed to read the same verse either in public or in private. 
KJB. Genesis 4 verse 1, And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived, and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. A child reading the King James Bible does not even think to inquire concerning the meaning of the statement that Adam knew Eve. This is God's way of protecting innocent minds until they have matured and need a discussion concerning marital relations. Notice that Eve said that she received, or had gotten, a man from the Lord. Since she was not God, she did not claim to have created Cain. Now, Consider the same passage from the KJB by comparing it to the Living Bible. LB. Genesis 4 verse 1 Then Adam had sexual intercourse with Eve his wife, and she conceived and gave birth to a son, Cain, meaning I have created. For, as she said, with God's help, I have created a man. Most children reading this verse from the Living Bible would have their curiosity piqued sufficiently to ask the meaning of sexual intercourse. Why would any parent want plainer language such as this for his children? However, the explicit language identifies only half of the problem associated with this one verse. In addition to the more explicit language, Eve claims in the Living Bible to be the creator of Cain. To create means to produce, to bring into being from nothing, to cause to exist. Cain was produced from normal marital relations not from nothing. Eve did not cause Cain to exist. God is the only one who creates. The Living Bible's explicit nature is not confined to a single verse and a single couple. A further examination of this translation reveals that Adam and Eve are only the tip of the proverbial iceberg. Are the motives of these modern versions pure, you be the judge? Regardless of the hidden motives, the words and thoughts conveyed to our youth certainly are not. KJB Leviticus 18 verse 19 Also thou shalt not approach unto a woman to uncover her nakedness, as long as she is put apart for her uncleanness. LB Leviticus 18 verse 19 There must be no sexual relationship with a woman who is menstruating. Does your eight-year-old know what that means? Should she be reading this in her Bible and bringing these matters to mind before her parents think it best to explain to her these delicate matters? Unfortunately, our present promiscuous climate would deem such a question as old-fashioned or naive. The next passage from the Living Bible not only uses both terms dealt with so far, but also aligns itself with Rome's practice of excommunicating its parishioners. KJB Leviticus 20 verse 18 And if a man shall lie with a woman having her sickness, and shall uncover her nakedness, he hath discovered her fountain, and she hath uncovered the fountain of her blood, and both of them shall be cut off from among their people. LB Leviticus 20 verse 18 If a man has sexual intercourse with a woman during her period of menstruation, both shall be excommunicated, for he has uncovered the source of her flow, and she has permitted it. Does God excommunicate people? According to Rome, excommunicate means to expel from communion, to eject from the communion of the church by an ecclesiastical sentence and deprive of spiritual advantages. Was Leviticus written to communicate matters foreign to Israel and inapplicable to true believers? The Living Bible raises more unnecessary questions. KJB Isaiah 8 verse 3 And I went unto the prophetess, and she conceived, and bare a son. Then said the Lord to me, Call his name Marshall Al Hashbaz. LB. Isaiah 8 verse 3 Then I had sexual intercourse with my wife, and she conceived and bore me a son. And the Lord said, Call him Marshall Al Hashbaz. Would you like your eight year old to question you concerning intimate details with your spouse? We should strive to keep our children's minds pure rather than exposing them to the explicit language originating from a supposed Bible. The next verse explains the three reasons why we are commanded to love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. 1 John 2 verse 15 KJB 1 John 2 verse 16 For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. We are not to love the world because the world is made up of 1. The lust of the flesh, 2. The lust of the eyes, and 3. The pride of life. These are not of the Father. The Living Bible changes the meaning of the passage limiting its application considerably. Consider how they have restricted the lust of the flesh to one area. LB 1 John 2 verse 16 For all these worldly things, these evil desires the craze for sex, the ambition to buy everything that appeals to you, and the pride that comes from wealth and importance these are not from God. They are from this evil world itself. Reading Kenneth Taylor's thoughts reveals that he may have had some very serious issues. 
The lust of the flesh is not limited as the living Bible would have you believe. One example should sufficiently prove this truth. The temptation of Eve included the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. However, her temptation did not involve Kenneth Taylor's craze. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, the lust of the flesh, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, the lust of the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, the pride of life, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Genesis 3 verse 6 Man cannot change God's word without dire consequences. The Living Bible seems to have been written with the same fixation as Hollywood entertainment. The initial text copyright for the Living Bible was issued in 1971. Therefore, this fixation in a so-called Bible preceded the world's almost total obsession with things of this nature by over one decade. For proof of the veracity of this statement, simply watch the first few minutes of any sitcom produced within the last 15 years and compare it with The Andy Griffith Show or Leave It to Beaver. Elijah and the Prophets in the book of 1 Kings, Elijah challenges the prophets of Baal to a contest to determine which group was serving the true and living God. Each side was to dress a bullock and place it on the altar and then call upon the name of their respective God or gods. The one that answered by fire would be the true God. The prophets of Baal called upon their God from morning until noon, to no avail. We pick up the story when these exasperated prophets of Baal finally leap upon the altar. KJB 1 Kings 18 verse 27 And it came to pass at noon, that Elijah mocked them, and said, Cry aloud, for he is a god, either he is talking, or he is pursuing, or he is in a journey, or peradventure he sleepeth, and must be awaked. I guess this is one of those cases where the oldest and best manuscripts said something different from the old, archaic King James Bible. Can you imagine the prophet Elijah speaking in the manner attributed to him by Mr. Taylor? For any spiritually minded child of God, the living Bible brings the word of God down to a level of disgrace. With examples of such wretched spirituality, is it any wonder that parents must constantly fight against the influence of corrupt language upon children today? LB 1 Kings 18 verse 27 And about noontime, Elijah began mocking them. You'll have to shout louder than that. He scoffed, to catch the attention of your God. Perhaps he is talking to someone, or is sitting on the toilet, or maybe he is away on a trip, or is asleep and needs to be wakened. Is this Mr. Taylor's idea of helping the children relate to Elijah? We need to help our children rise up out of the mediocrity so prevalent today, not promote it by providing them with these types of examples. By condoning and actually encouraging this kind of nonsense, parents may be part of the problem rather than part of the solution. We must assist our children so they can be an example to other Christians, in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. 1 Timothy 4 verse 12 Saul's Anger our first example dealt with Kenneth Taylor and the Living Bible's depraved fixations. The second dealt with Elijah's supposed comments to the prophets of Baal. Now, we shall examine the comments of a father to his son according to Mr. Taylor. First, we read and consider the true word of God. KJB 1 Samuel 20 verse 30 Then Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan, and he said unto him, Thou son of the perverse rebellious woman, do not I know that thou hast chosen the son of Jesse to thine own confusion, and unto the confusion of thy mother's nakedness? This example is provided almost without comment due to its absurdity. However, the point must be reiterated that the words recorded below are supposed to be the words of a father to his son. They are bleeped out here for the sake of the reader's sensibility. LB 1 Samuel 20 verse 30 Saul boiled with rage. Use underscore of AB, he yelled at him. Do you think I don't know that? You want the son of a nobody to be king in your place, shaming yourself and your mother? Note, the actual words were included in the text of the Living Bible. Note, after many concerned parents and Bible believers raised quite a fuss concerning this needless profanity, the editors of the Living Bible removed the offensive terminology from their later editions. Its very removal further demonstrates the complete lack of respect for the Word of God among promoters of the modern versions. They can change the Bible at will because they have very little regard for what God has promised concerning His infallible Holy Word. The language of our children and society, general, continues to rapidly deteriorate. The Bible not contribute to this decline in quality of speech. 
Every new version claims to make the Bible easier to understand and read, but the Word of God is sacred. The Word of God is spiritually discerned, 1 Corinthians 2 verse 14, and not intended to read like some cheap paperback novel. This is God's book. Old, certainly. The primary purpose for updating the modern translations almost annually seems to be money, 1 Timothy 6 verse 10. The common excuse of trying to make the Bible easier to understand is indeed pretty lame, especially when one considers that some things are best left unsaid or written in such a way that a child does not question the inferred meaning until mature enough to handle such delicate matters. In the mid-90s, the Living Bible was still selling about one half million copies per year. In fact, for some churchgoers, the Living Bible remains the only version of the Bible they read or carry to church. A few of the worst problems and most pathetic examples contained in the Living Bible have been discussed. However, the doctrinal errors contained within its pages are far more serious and numerous. Entire books could be devoted to the doctrinal errors and attacks upon truth contained in the pages of the Living Bible. We must never accept the Devil's Bill of Goods, especially where our youth are concerned. Young people can be as spiritual as any adult Christian. However, adults must do their part to provide a spiritually nurturing environment. Let us encourage our children to live above the fray, rather than bringing God's word down to the lowest common denominator. Much more space could be devoted to exposing the Living Bible's indiscriminate handling of delicate subjects. The New International Version exhibits the same inability to address these matters in a fashion pleasing to God. Once again, by comparing the NIV with the King James Bible, we can see that God intended these subjects to be discreetly handled. Praise God! The Custom of Women KJB Genesis 31 verse 35 And she said to her father, Let it not displease my Lord that I cannot rise up before thee, for the custom of women is upon me. And he searched, but found not the images. Many years ago, this subject would never have been discussed in public, let alone on television commercials or as the fodder for foul humor. Commercial television began frankly discussing these matters in the 1990s. However, the NIV preceded this degrading practice by two decades. Thus, the indiscriminate handling of this particular subject did not begin outside the church. Anytime this passage was read publicly, corrupt communication was promoted by the church, Ephesians 4 verse 29. Neve, Genesis 31 verse 35 Rachel said to her father, Don't be angry, my lord, that I cannot stand up in your presence, I'm having my period. So he searched but could not find the household gods. Contemporary society now accepts discussing in mixed company certain subjects which our parents and grandparents never considered appropriate. Is this really progress? Much of this discussion would have been deemed indecent, even if the discussion were limited to women. We don't need our Bible modernized. After reading these modern versions, we need our minds cleansed and our mouths washed out with soap. Filthy communication. The Apostle Paul instructs us to put off filthy communication out of your mouth. Colossians 3 verse 8. The next verse from the King James Bible may not be one commonly used for memory work, yet it certainly does not convey the same disgusting vision communicated by the modern versions. KJB Ezekiel 23 verse 20 For she doted upon their paramours, whose flesh is as the flesh of asses, and whose issue is like the issue of horses. The NIV continues the onslaught upon common decency in the next passage. Someone needs to explain how a person can obey God to keep his mind pure while feasting upon explicit trash, conveyed by the NIV. No other version on the market reads as indecently as the NIV. Neve. Ezekiel 23 verse 20 There she lusted after her lovers, whose genitals were like those of donkeys and whose omission was like that of horses. Really? When I first began teaching these comparisons of Bible versions in churches, I used overhead transparencies. Because I had the preceding verse from the NIV printed on the overhead, I would cover the bottom part of the transparency, explaining that I could not show this particular verse from the NIV in mixed company, let alone in a church service. However, the first time I taught it using the overheads, a visitor at my home church using an NIV was sitting in the second row of pews. Unbeknown to me, she and her husband turned to the passages in the NIV as I taught each subject. You can imagine their reaction when they read this verse from the NIV. In fact, the entire church heard her gasp as she read the passage I determined would not be read publicly. The Old Paths 
Most of the comparisons addressed in this chapter concern the degrading of language. Although this next verse does not impact the Bible in the same manner, I find it just as deplorable. Even a seemingly pure motive of modernizing the language of the Bible can have a profound effect on modern-day worship. The new versions even affect our favorite old hymns of the faith. Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways, and see, and ask for the old. Paths, where is the good way? And walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk therein, Jeremiah 6 verse 16. A common misconception today is the notion that churches must change their style of music in order to keep pace with the changing whims of the people. With the modern style of music has come a modern form of worship that eliminates the use of the old hymns. In the modern versions, one can find little or no basis for singing songs like at Calvary. Read the words to this great song which reflect the great heritage that far too many people have allowed to slip away. At Calvary Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. Chorus Mercy there was great, and grace was free, pardon there was multiplied to me, there my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. By God's word at last my sin I learned, then I trembled at the law I'd spurned, till my guilty soul imploring turned to Calvary. Now I've given to Jesus everything, now I gladly own him as my king, now my raptured soul can only sing of Calvary. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan, oh, the grace that brought it down to man, oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. The only reason we know about Calvary is because of the King James Bible. The Bible in the book of Luke mentions Calvary only one time. Furthermore, Luke is the only book of the Bible to mention Calvary at all. KJB Luke 23 verse 33 And when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Satan wants to destroy the old paths by creating a generation that has very little or no appreciation for its rich heritage. When the Antichrist shows up, he will point to the cross as an example of a man getting his due reward. Constantly, those with a hidden agenda are rewriting history in order to distort the truth and the past. Are they the only ones? In the NIV, none of the gospel books mentions Calvary because Calvary has been removed from the one book that mentions it in the Word of God. NIV Luke 23 verse 33 When they came to the place called the Skull, there they crucified him, along with the criminals one on his right. What reason would there be to sing a song like at Calvary, if no one even knows what it symbolizes? One might respond well, of course everyone knows what Calvary means. Only because of the King James Bible. That's the point. Future generations with all of their modern versions will have no knowledge of this place that churches have sung about for centuries. Satan knows that man must become ignorant of his past before he can effectively be deceived to repeat the same condemning errors. Satan desires to displace the Lord Jesus Christ. Music is only one of the very powerful media he uses to accomplish this end. I travel extensively preaching and teaching. On one of my trips with the Baptist History Preservation Society, we went to Cox's Creek Baptist Church, now a Southern Baptist Church, in Cox's Creek, Kentucky. We sang at Calvary using their hymnal produced by the Southern Baptists. As I sang from the hymnal, I noticed that all of the songs included a verse of scripture in the header. This one included the verse that references Calvary, Luke 23 verse 33, only all of their quotes originated from the NIV, when they came to the place called the Skull, there they crucified him, along with the criminals one on his right, the other on his left. How can the significance be missed? Calvary is a Bible term like many of the others found within the pages of the real Bible. Do you know why the Southern Baptists included this particular choice of verses in their hymnal 4 at Calvary? Because the verse is supposed to be about Calvary. Christians need to learn the terminology of the Bible. It is a lame excuse to claim that these words should be deleted since man does not use them in everyday speech and no longer understands what they mean. When did the common man ever understand justification, sanctification, atonement, regeneration, and repentance? When did the unbeliever ever fully understand this terminology? The answer is, never. These terms are peculiar and special and our business as preachers is to show that our gospel message is divinely elevated above ordinary matters. Consider this. When did the natural man ever understand the true meaning of John 3 verse 16? Read the next story and see if the natural man can really comprehend the depths of God's love. John 3 verse 16. 
In the city of Chicago, one cold, dark night, a blizzard was setting in. A little boy was selling newspapers on the corner. The people were in and out of the cold. The little boy was so cold that he wasn't trying to sell many papers. He walked up to a policeman and said, Mister, you wouldn't happen to know where a poor boy could find a warm place to sleep tonight, would you? You see, I sleep in a box up around the corner there and down the alley and it's awful cold in there for tonight. Sure would be nice to have a warm place to stay. The policeman looked down at the little boy and said, You go down the street to that big white house and you knock on the door. When they come out the door you just say John 3 verse 16 and they will let you in. So he did. He walked up the steps and knocked on the door and a lady answered. He looked up and said, John 3 verse 16. The lady said, Come on in, son. She took him in and she sat him down in a split bottom rocker in front of a great big old fireplace and she walked away. The boy sat there for a while and thought to himself, John 3 verse 16, I don't understand it but it sure makes a cold boy warm. Later she came back and asked him, are you hungry? He said, well, just a little. I haven't eaten in a couple of days, and I guess I could stand a little bit of food. The lady took him in the kitchen and sat him down to a table full of wonderful food. He ate and ate until he couldn't eat anymore. Then he thought to himself, John 3 verse 16, boy, I sure don't understand it, but it sure makes a hungry boy full. She took him upstairs to a bathroom to a huge bathtub filled with warm water, and he sat there and soaked for a while. As he soaked, he thought to himself, John 3 verse 16, I sure don't understand it, but it sure makes a dirty boy clean. You know, I've not had a bath, a real bath, in my whole life. The only bath I ever had was when I stood in front of that big old fire hydrant as they flushed it out. The lady came in and got him. She took him to a room, tucked him into a big old feather bed, pulled the covers up around his neck, kissed him goodnight and turned out the lights. As he lay in the darkness and looked out the window at the snow coming down on that cold night, he thought to himself, John 3 verse 16, I don't understand it, but it sure makes a tired boy rested. The next morning the lady came back up and took him down again to that same big table full of food. After he ate, she took him back to that same big old split bottom rocker in front of the fireplace and picked up a big old Bible. She sat down in front of him and looked into his young face. Do you understand John 3 verse 16? She asked gently. He replied, no, ma'am, I don't. The first time I ever heard it was last night when the policeman told me to use it. She opened the Bible to John 3 verse 16 and began to explain to him about Jesus. Right there, in front of that big old fireplace, he gave his heart and life to Jesus Christ. He sat there and thought, John 3 verse 16, I don't understand it, but it sure makes a lost boy feel safe. You know, I have to confess I don't understand it either, how God was willing to send his son to die for me, and how Jesus would agree to do such a thing. I don't understand the agony of the Father and every angel in heaven as they watched Jesus suffer and die. I don't understand the intense love for me that kept Jesus on the cross till the end. I don't understand it, but it sure does make life worth living, author unknown. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3 verse 16. I wish the book could stop here reflecting the extent of the discussion concerning the perversion of God's word. Unfortunately, our study thus far has only scratched the surface, and there is so much more to consider. The issue is far too serious to end for the sake of those who find this issue distasteful or divisive. The changes impact major. Doctrines and certainly impact the Christian's walk with Christ. Should we just accept the changes for the sake of unity? Unity for the Christian must never result from compromising truth. Unity can only come when each side or party agrees that God is right and man is wrong. 1 Kenneth Taylor, The Children's Living Bible, Wheaton, Illinois, Tyndall House Publishers, 1972. 6. Godly Living versus Good Intentions and they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Daniel 12 verse 3. Modern version claimed that they simply want to make the Bible easier to understand. 
When then do they make knowing how to live right more difficult for Christians? The modern versions neither teach the Christian living standards demanded by God, nor do they stress the same level of importance of living a godly life as does the King James Bible. For a Christian who has an absolute standard to follow, Satan's schemes are rarely difficult to identify. He recognizes his advantage when pastors and Christians alike have no definite criteria by which to judge right from wrong. Without a true standard of judgment, one cannot take the firm stand for righteousness that God demands. As the following passages are presented, consider whether the modern versions or the King James Bible glorify God the most by presenting the holiest standard of living. Your reasonable service. God wants the Christian devoted to his service. However, the devil wants the Christian satisfied with mediocrity. Comparing the King James Bible with the NIV clearly contrasts God's will versus the hand of Satan. The inconsistencies between devoted service and simple mediocrity should become quite clear. KJB Romans 12 verse 1 I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. God commands Christians to present their bodies as living sacrifices. As Christians obey this command by sacrificial service to the Lord, God does not consider this to be a noteworthy endeavor. Instead, he considers complete surrender to his will as merely reasonable in light of his sacrifice on our behalf. The NIV changes reasonable service into an elevated spiritual act of worship. This does not represent the mind of God on the matter. Neve. Romans 12 verse 1 Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God this is your spiritual act of worship. The NIV asserts that the sacrificial surrender of our lives to the Lord is something super spiritual when God's word affirms that it is simply our reasonable service. The NIV changes the context of this act making it sound highly commendable in the eyes of God, an accomplishment of which one should be proud. Most people who fail to present their bodies as living sacrifices find their greatest battles involve their flesh. Students of the book, contrary to Satan's plan, realize that their old man is corrupt with absolutely no redeeming qualities, Mark 10 verse 18, Romans 3 verse 10, KJB, Ephesians 4 verse 22 that he put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. Every Christian should realize that until God delivers us from the body of this death, Romans 7 verse 24, and changes our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. Philippians 3 verse 21, we are stuck with our corrupt old man. Of course, the NIV even changes this vivid terminology from vile body to lowly body in the book of Philippians. There is a big difference between these two images, just as there is a vast chasm between the NIV and the KJB. The KJB clearly states that our old man is corrupt. However, the NIV states that it is being corrupted, a process occurring over time. Neve. Ephesians 4 verse 22 you were taught, with regard to your former way of life, to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. There is a considerable difference between something that is corrupt by nature and something that is being corrupted. Something that is in the process of corruption can have other redeeming qualities. However, our old man is corrupt and we must continually walk in the spirit. Galatians 5 verse 16, in order to put off the old man with his deeds. Though these changes are bad enough, they can and do get much worse. Literally, hundreds of verses in the modern versions could be provided illustrating this corruption and revealing a satanic attack against godly living. Here is another case in point. The Lord wants us to understand that the only way for old age and the signs of old age to be a blessing is for an individual to live a righteous life for the Lord. Thus, Solomon includes the word if to indicate the conditional promise attached to the man or woman living for God as they mature up in years. KJB Proverbs 16 verse 31 The hoary head is a crown of glory, if it be found in the way of righteousness. The only way for old age, signified by the hoary head, Leviticus 19 verse 32, Isaiah 46 verse 4, to be a crown of glory is if the individual is found in the way of righteousness. The NIV warns of no such conditional promise attached to old age. The NIV states that all gray-headed people have lived a righteous life. Ludicrous. Neve. Proverbs 16 verse 31 Gray hair is a crown of splendor, it is attained by a righteous life. Really? Are you kidding me? 
The NIV states that gray hair is attained by a righteous life. This means that every person with the signs of age, and those prematurely grayed, have attained this crown of splendor through righteous living. As much as we would like this to be true, it is another of Satan's lies contrived to produce a false sense of accomplishment. Suffering for Christ's sake The only way to firmly stand for righteousness is to know that you base your spiritual position on something absolutely infallible in its guidance. No modern version on the market provides a person with the assurance needed to take the appropriate godly moral stand. For example, the King James Bible makes a definite statement concerning the results of living godly. KJB 2 Timothy 3 verse 12 Yeah, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. The King James Bible says that a godly person will suffer persecution in this world. God expects Christians to live godly. If a child of God suffers persecution because he lives a godly life for Jesus Christ, God will reward him in the future. We will see this truth even more clearly in the next comparison. The NIV subtly encourages Christians to feel self-satisfied so long as they have a desire to live godly. Unlike the statement from the KJB, the NIV no longer requires the child of God to put his desires into action. It says that one need only want to live godly to suffer persecution. Satan wants every Christian to be satisfied with a lesser standard. Neve. 2 Timothy 3 verse 12 In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Some practical applications can help to discern the far-reaching ramifications of this change. According to the NIV, if a person decides that he wants to begin witnessing, he will be persecuted for that desire alone. Or if a person decides that he wants to take a stand against profanity at the workplace, he will be persecuted for that desire alone. One who wants to live a godly life, the NIV, and one who lives godly, the KJB, are two different people, exhibiting two entirely unequal types of behavior, Romans 7 verse 18. The standard conveyed by the King James Bible requires action, not merely possession of good intentions. Simply desiring to do right without acting upon it has certainly never caused anyone to suffer. These modern version changes are critical when one considers the promises of future reward related to the suffering of Christian experiences, as found in the next comparison. When comparing scripture with scripture from the KJB, one can ascertain the full revelation concerning living godly and obtaining future rewards. God attaches some very important promises to suffering. The next passage from the KJB says that if we suffer, we will reign with the Lord Jesus Christ, as joint heirs Romans 8 verse 17. KJB 2 Timothy 2 verse 12 If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Combining the truths taught in 2 Timothy 2 verse 12 with those in 2 Timothy 3 verse 12 from the KJB gives a clear picture of God's expectations and the rewards promised for faithful service. The KJB shows that reigning with the Lord Jesus Christ is directly associated with suffering for Him in this life. If a person lives godly, he will suffer persecution. If he suffers persecution, he will jointly reign with the Lord. If he denies the suffering by failing to live godly, God will deny him the future opportunity to reign with him, though not denied entry into the kingdom. The only hope of arriving at this truth is by comparing scripture with scripture, 1 Corinthians 2 verse 13. Needless to say, verse wording must remain intact to enable cross-referencing these verses. A concordance word search for suffer will yield two different results, depending upon the version searched. The NIV destroys this important truth and eliminates any opportunity for cross-referencing by changing suffer to endure. Neve. 2 Timothy 2 verse 12 If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. One should recognize that the NIV not only changes the truth, but also completely perverts a church-age doctrine by relating a person's faithfulness to a tribulation word, endure, Matthew 24 verse 13. Although this passage was covered in chapter 4, the point bears repeating and expanding here. When the NIV changes deny to disown, it changes the truth of God into a lie, Romans 1 verse 25. To disown someone is a much more severe action than to deny him something. If we deny God our service and suffering, He will deny us the reward of reigning with Him. However, we will still be His and will remain with Him for eternity because He cannot deny Himself. God is faithful to His word even when we are not, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 9. When the NIV uses disown, 
God appears to contradict himself by disowning his children, severing his relationship. However, he has assured us repeatedly elsewhere that he will never do that. Consequently, the NIV turns God into a liar. What kind of godly living standard is that? The contradictions and errors do not stop at these two glaring blunders. The next passage, 2 Timothy 2 verse 13, in the NIV continues to compound the comedy of errors. It says, if we are faithless, he will remain faithful, for he cannot disown himself. Try to make sense of this contradiction. Verse 12 in the NIV says that God will disown the Christian, and then verse 13 in the NIV says that God cannot disown the Christian because he cannot disown himself. How illogical! Spiritually blind editors fail to see the contradictory comments even if the verses appear back to back. The modern versions eliminate any opportunity for effective Bible study through these changes. The Bible version debate is in no way limited to fighting against the modernization of the reading or unnecessarily updating of the language. Comparing scripture with scripture is one of the keys to effective Bible study. When words are changed, one no longer has the basic tools necessary for Bible study. No matter how some men try to belittle those who are truly searching for the truth, one must carefully consider the evidence at hand. Look at the comparisons and see which one elevates our Lord and Savior. James White is a good example of an individual who attacks those who examine the evidence from a Bible-believing perspective. In his book The King James Only Controversy, his introduction disparages the true student of God's word. Most biblical scholars and theologians, even of the most conservative stripe, do not feel the issue worthy of any real investment of time. He goes on to say, our relationship with Jesus Christ is not based upon a particular Bible translation. 1. Why then has Mr. White invested so much time and effort, and made so much money, on the subject? It should be evident that the so-called scholars and theologians should invest their time in finding the truth. Our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ is dependent upon the truth revealed through His Word. Thus, our relationship with Jesus Christ is based upon a particular Bible translation. Each chapter in this book proves that the modern versions leave the Christian less accountable to God and present a lower standard of godly living. Claiming that these changes do not directly affect the reader's relationship with Jesus Christ is deceitful. The driving force behind Bible translations is that of qualifying for a new copyright. In order to qualify for a new copyright, Bible revisers know that they must change a significant amount of text. Consequently, they deceive the public by using slick Hollywood advertising to convince people that they need the most up-to-date, modern, smooth-talking version produced for the common man, written in easy-to-understand English. However, when the words are changed, the opportunity for proper study is lost, 2 Timothy 2 verse 15, and the truth turns into error. Bear your own cross. Luke depicts a beautiful picture of the Christian's responsibility to bear his own cross. And whosoever doth not bear his cross, and come after me, cannot be my disciple. Luke 14 verse 27 Too many people are failing to recognize their responsibility to suffer for the sake of Christ. Simon, the Cyrenian had to literally bear the cross of Jesus Christ thus providing us a beautiful picture of our responsibility to spiritually bear his cross. KJB Luke 23 verse 26 And as they led him away, they laid hold upon one Simon, a Cyrenian, coming out of the country, and on him they laid the cross, that he might bear it after Jesus. The KJB retains this poignant illustration. Every Christian is supposed to bear his own cross following Jesus. Do the modern versions provide the same spiritually poignant illustration? Neve. Luke 23 verse 26 As they led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way and from the country, and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. The extraordinary wording of the KJB did not materialize on its own, nor did it take place by accident. God providentially planned for his message to be conveyed both literally and figuratively. The depth of the riches found within God's word is sometimes incomprehensible. Satan wants to minimize man's opportunity to appreciate God's goodness and, sometimes, completely obliterate it. Higher Standards As we have seen, God promises to reward those who suffer persecution for living a godly life. As is evident from studying God's expectations, not everyone will be rewarded for simply being a Christian. God gives Christians some high standards following salvation. Here is another example of those high expectations. 
The child of God not only has the responsibility to abstain from evil, but also must abstain from anything that has the appearance of evil. Complying with this truth has kept many Christians out of countless ruinous situations. KJB 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 22 Abstain from all appearance of evil. Even if the act or action is not evil in and of itself, one must abstain from the act or action if it simply appears to be wrong. What a tremendous truth to know. This is one of God's prescribed methods for staying out of trouble. Many Christians are falling into sin because they are reading from the wrong Bible. The modern Bibles fail to warn Christians to avoid potentially destructive situations by changing the verse to restate the obvious. Neve. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 22 Avoid every kind of evil. What authority does the NIV have to lower God's higher standards? Obviously Christians should avoid every kind of evil. But what about something that has the capacity to destroy your testimony, but in and of itself is not evil? God commands us to abstain from these things, too. The KJB repeatedly embodies a higher standard than that expressed in the modern translations. God commands us to abstain from that which even appears evil. Many things look evil or have a potential for evil, but are not evil in and of themselves. Being a talebearer blessing or curse? The King James Bible rebukes the talebearer, one that slanders or gossips by bearing a tale about another person. This serious offense has caused great harm to the cause of Christ. The damage to the lost along with weak brothers and sisters in Christ is incalculable. The judgment seat of Christ will expose the damage done to countless lives through such gossip. KJB Proverbs 26 verse 22 The words of a talebearer are as wounds, and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. A talebearer profoundly harms his victim. The Bible says that the tongue is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. James 3 verse 8 with the same mouth, we bless God and curse men. Proverbs says these words are as wounds. They are injurious. Does the NIV convey the same sense of harm and destruction? Neve. Proverbs 26 verse 22 The words of a gossip are like choice morsels. They go down to a man's inmost part. The NIV seems to encourage the despicable act of gossip. The NIV says that a gossip's words are like choice morsels. Are you kidding me? Choice morsels are the best part of something. They are something to be desired, rather than shunned. The NIV fails to warn and rebuke its readers, but both parties are guilty the one who gossips and the one who listens. No wonder the world sees little difference between churchgoers and those who find more important things to do on Sunday. The true word of God holds man accountable for his actions. Faith to believe God's promise. If the motive of the new translations is to update the language of the King James Bible, then why do they differ so greatly on the subject of faith? Although this verse was also addressed in an earlier chapter, it will again be discussed from a slightly different perspective. KJB Psalm 12 verse 6 The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Seven thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. God has promised to preserve his word. Every Christian should ask himself, where is the preserved word of God today? Since God has promised to preserve his word, where can it be found? The King James Bible is the only version that has preachers proclaiming to the world that it is God's perfectly preserved word without error or mistake. I believe God's promises. Therefore, I believe we have his word today. However, the faithless can be convinced neither by me nor by God. There are difficult passages in the Word of God that seem to be contradictory and thus appear to contain error. How does one handle these potential bombshells? Only by faith can some of these be studied, understood, and believed. Faith is a requirement for the Word of God to do an effectual work in a person's life. The Word of God says that, whatsoever is not of faith is sin, Romans 14 verse 23. This truth applies to a failure to have faith in the actual words of God, too. It is sin. The Word of God goes on to say that faith is a necessary element for pleasing God. But without faith it is impossible to please Him. Hebrews 11 verse 6. This truth applies also to a failure to have faith in the actual words of God. It is impossible to please God without faith. A lack of belief causes the work of God to suffer today, just as it did during the Lord's earthly ministry. The opportunity for the Lord to do a great work was limited due to a lack of faith, and He did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. 
Matthew 13 verse 58 Because people do not accept the word of God as it is in truth the word of God the mighty works that God desires to accomplish in their lives are limited. A constant state of confusion best describes the world today. Part of this crisis is attributable to the ineffectiveness of preaching from pulpits. But what has caused the ineptitude of the pulpits? Although preachers bear their share of the blame, the negative influence of the modern translations on the faith of the believers has had a far greater impact. Satan has accomplished his objective of destroying the works of God by undermining the believer's faith. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Hebrews 4 verse 2 the word of God must be mixed with faith for it to be profitable. Moreover, it must be accepted as God's word for it to work effectively in an individual's life. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because, when ye received the word of God which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 13 If the Christian lacks faith in the word of God or considers it to be the word of men, the word of God will be unprofitable and ineffectual. When the next passage, verses 6 and 7 from Psalm 12, is considered from the NIV, the resultant widespread destruction of faith can be clearly foreseen as the devil's handiwork. Neve Psalm 12 verse 6 And the words of the Lord are flawless, like silver refined in a furnace of clay, purified seven times. The NIV eliminates the promise of preservation and then changes the entire context of the verse from preservation of the word of God to protection of man. Neve. Psalm 12 verse 7 O Lord, you will keep us safe and protect us from such people forever. We are not to trust in man's wisdom. However, this warning has generally gone unheeded by the revisionists. Every modern version claims to be the product of the very best scholars and masquerades as newer and better than all its predecessors. God explicitly warns man concerning the outcome of trusting in this so-called scholarship, preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 17. Because the church has trusted more in scholarship than in God, the pulpits have lost much of their effectiveness. See Ecclesiastes 12 verse 11 in the NKJV for a case in point. The next passage reveals that faith comes from hearing the word of God. Faith does not come from simply hearing a message someone preaches, it comes from hearing the very words of God. Since the modern translations are not really the word of God, though they may contain snippets of it, a lack of faith can be easily attributed to these so-called Bibles. KJB Romans 10 verse 17 So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. The modern version reader should quickly notice the departure from the word of God and the misplaced emphasis on the message instead. There are more ways of hearing than by a message from a man. In fact, the scriptures themselves speak at least according to the KJB, Romans 9 verse 17, Galatians 3 verse 8. If any particular passage, changed by the modern versions, no longer speaks to the individual, how can he hear and thereby receive the necessary faith? 1 Corinthians 14 verse 8. A message no longer containing the words of God has created a very superficial Christianity. Faith comes from the very words of God, so vehemently attacked and undermined today. The modern versions now limit the word of God to the word of Christ. Many would assume the word of Christ to refer to the red lettering found in the Gospels. Neve. Romans 10 verse 17 Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. There are a number of Christian personalities whose influence amongst Christians stems more from their charismatic teaching style than from their exaltation of the words of God. These individuals can, and do, pick and choose from the various modern versions in order to construct and support their man-pleasing, ear-tickling messages. If they refer to the KJB, it is usually apologetically asking the audience to bear with them as they quote from the archaic King James for sake of its poetic renderings. Unflinching disrespect for the word of God. People are becoming conditioned to believe that a man's personality and his message are more authoritative than the very words of God. For instance, James White, in his book on the King James Bible, states, We strongly encourage Christians to purchase and use multiple translations of the Bible so that comparison can be made between translations. It is best not to be limited to just one translation when studying scripture. 
cross-reference between such fine translations as the New King James Version, the New American Standard Bible, and the New International Version will allow the student of the Bible to get a firm grasp upon the meaning of any particular passage. Point two. Mr. White has no absolute or final authority and encourages his followers to be their own judge and jury upon God's word. The Romans passage in the modern versions also redirects focus away from the Word of God in general to the Word of Christ in particular. I asked a group of young people what the Word of Christ is, and they said it is found in the four Gospel books. One of them even said, it is the red letters in the Bible. Many Bible publishers incorporate the use of red lettering when referring to Christ's spoken words during his earthly ministry. The NIV rendering of Romans 10 verse 17 indicates that the way for a person to receive faith is by simply reading the four gospel books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John the word of Christ spoken while he was on earth. Neve. Romans 10 verse 17 Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. However, the Gospels do not contain the primary church age doctrine found in the 13 epistles bearing Paul's name as their first word. Satan wants our focus directed away from the Apostle Paul's ministry to the church, 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1, 2 Timothy 2 verse 7. The NIV actually elevates the earthly words of Christ above the rest of his word. This is unscriptural and weakens one's faith. Necessity of Bible study Those who understand how to study the Bible realize that proper, effective study requires a person to rightly divide the Bible, 2 Timothy 2 verse 15, and consider what the Apostle Paul tells the church first, 2 Timothy 2 verse 7. The NIV and Satan have joined forces to obscure these truths. Studying God's Word is important for Christian growth and spiritual maturity. However, only one verse in the Bible commands a person to study God's Word and subsequently explains how to do so. KJB 2 Timothy 2 verse 15 Study to shew thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. God does not approve of anyone who fails to study his word. Obviously, the individual who studies God's word must study it using God's prescribed method of Bible study. Those who fail to study and fail to study it God's way will be ashamed. This shame may manifest itself both in the present life and at the judgment seat of Christ. As the King James Bible is compared with the NIV, Satan's handiwork becomes much clearer. The two key points of this verse are eliminated. No longer is the Christian commanded to study, and no longer does this verse reveal how to study. Neve. 2 Timothy 2 verse 15 Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. While God does want us to do our best, He wants us to know how to do our best by studying His infallible word. He also wants us to know how to study His way. The modern versions are purposefully vague, allowing everyone to do what is right in his own eyes. Meanwhile, the King James Bible instructs both what to do and how to do it God's way. God does not want you simply to do your best. He commands you to study even when you don't have the time or the inclination to do so. Moreover, he does not want the preacher, teacher, or student simply to correctly handle the word of God. He wants them to know how to study his word. Christians empowered with scriptural understanding pose the greatest threat to Satan's assault. The King James Bible contains the word study only three times, however, only one verse contains the command to study with the how-to instructions. Christians reading the modern versions will not be convicted concerning their lack of Bible study. Without the required and correct Bible study, a Christian never matures into adulthood forever stunting their spiritual growth. The judgment seat of Christ will not afford the opportunity to answer God with the excuse, I did my best. Yet, we have Bible translations changing the most important verse concerning Bible study into a vague do your best philosophy. The baby Christian could conclude that he will be able to answer God with the excuse of having tried and be acquitted of ignoring clearly presented truths from God's true word. Ignorance is not bliss. The tare and the wheat. A tare in the field grows and matures very similar in the appearance to wheat. However, wheat produces fruit while tares do not. The Lord said to let the tares and the wheat grow together until the time of the harvest. 
he would have to separate the tares and the wheat because the Lord knoweth them that are his. 2 Timothy 2 verse 19. The servants ask the householder how the tares showed up. KJB. Matthew 13 verse 27. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? Once again, the modern versions distort the explicit warnings concerning fake Christians by perverting the true words of God. The purpose of the parable refers to the fact that tares are frequently indistinguishable from the wheat. This is similar to distinguishing the true Christian from the lost person within the local church. The NIV completely distorts the point because weeds are easily distinguished from the wheat. Neve. Matthew 13 verse 27 The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? Due to their visual similarities, God chose wheat and tares to describe his harvest. One can easily distinguish between the NIV's wheat and weeds. The whole point is now lost. Of course, the modern versions not only destroy the doctrine, but also encourage a person to be an imitator of God. The NIV says, be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved children, NIV Ephesians 5 verse 1. However, the Bible commands that we be followers of God, not imitators of the real thing. We don't need any more imitation Christians. One White, the King James Only Controversy, Opsit, page 3, v. 2 Ibid, page 7.